Today is April the 30th, 2009, and we are here with Robert Madison. Uh, we're developing this interview for the Andrew A. Venable Oral History Collection and the Reflections of Black Life in Greater Cleveland Collection. Good morning, Mr. Madison. Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing us to come and visit with you. It's my pleasure. If you would please give us the date of birth and the place of birth for yourself. Well, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. July the 28th, 1923. 1923. Mm -hmm. And to the parents of? My father was Robert James Madison and my mother was Nettie Madison. Both of them were from Alabama. Aha. Uh -huh. And I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And almost immediately, six months old, we moved to Selma, Alabama. Oh, did you? And we moved to Selma, Alabama because my father was a, a civil engineer and they didn't hire colored people in Cleveland. So he had to find a job and he went to Selma, Alabama to, to teach at Selma University. Hmm. And he taught there for a number of years. He taught physics, mathematics. See, he was among the first graduates in civil engineering of black people in the country when he finished at Howard University. Uh -huh. But he couldn't get a job here because they didn't hire colored people. So he went there to teach. While at, uh, at uh, Selma, uh, he taught uh, mathematics, physics, and coached the football team, baseball team. And there, my brother Julian was born. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was born in Cleveland. Julian was born in Selma, Alabama. There's the two of you? Nope. Okay. Nope. There are four. Uh, but I wanted to, to get this phase out that while he was teaching, uh, and I started going to school, and I came home one day with a drawing of a, of a uh, sailboat. And my mother saw the sailboat and said, son, you're going to be an architect. I didn't have the slightest idea what architecture was, but she said so, and as far as I'm concerned, he did what mama said. Yes. So we were there from uh, 1923 until 27, and my father was moved to Benedict College in Columbia, South Carolina, where he continued teaching uh, physics and mathematics and coaching the football team. And while there, Stanley was born. Okay. Before Stanley was born, uh, and Julian was in, in Columbia, South Carolina, my mother said to him, son, you're going to be an engineer. To Julian. Julian. She said, and he said, yes, mother. You see, because she said, we have one engineer, my dad. I was an architect. Julian should be an engineer, too. And then we stayed there in Columbia, South Carolina, when Stanley was born. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother also was, she taught uh, drama. She was a graduate of Mor uh, Morris Brown College, and my father was a graduate of Howard University. Mm -hmm. At, at Columbia, at, at Benedict College, she taught uh, drama, because that was her field. We were there in Columbia, South Carolina, I guess, for about, uh, Stanley was born in 29. We moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, and the reason we moved to Washington, D.C., because my father had always yearned to do his profession. And he was offered a job in the War Department, it was called then, of the federal government. First federal, first time a hired black man had been hired to be a uh, civil engineer in the in the in what was called the um, War Department, which is now called Defense Department. Mm -hmm. And while we were there in in Washington D.C., Bernard was born. So that you got it, Julian, Robert, Julian, Stan, and Bernard, each in a different state. Okay. Uh, and everything was doing just fine. Then came the Depression, and the last to be hired is the first to be fired. Mm -hmm. And my, my father was, was released from his job, and from that point for the next four years, it was a very, very difficult time for us during the Depression. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved from house to house, and we were evicted numbers of times. We didn't have food some of the time because he couldn't get a job. Couldn't, he couldn't get a job in his field, and everybody would hire him. So he resorted to driving a taxi cab, uh, being a caddy on the golf course, which I felt very resentful of. He's, these white kids couldn't hold a cup to my father. He's out there holy carrying their bags. And so while we're in Washington, D.C., as I said before, we, we went there in the job. We had a nice house and we had a nice car and all that. But when the Depression hit, 
all that was gone. <laughs> Couldn't afford that. Uh, I went to, then I was going to school, and I went to Garnet Patterson High School, mm-hmm. junior high school. And uh, I was a good student. Mm-hmm. And being a good student, I was able to skip a grade. But while there, you, you have to remember that Washington, D.C. was a segregated city at that time. There were a lot of others, but I mean, Washington was segregated to the extent that the public schools were segregated. Mm-hmm. And they had one school for black people to study business, which was like uh, Dunbar High School, which was like ter- clerical stuff. Mm-hmm. One school, Armstrong High School, to study technology, as they call it, which was becoming the carpenter. And one school, which was for the college graduates, which was teachers. <coughs> so Dunbar, Armstrong, and Cadoza. Well, I wanted to be an architect, I be an architect, and they didn't teach that there in Washington, D.C., for black people. Mm-hmm. So that was when my, my family said, we could come back to Cleveland. So we moved back to Cleveland. It happens that my maternal grandmother was living here in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. So we came back to Cleveland uh, during the Depression. My father got a job with the city of Cleveland, and then um, I entered East Technical High School. Entered East Technical High School in 1937. It's a long time ago. <laughs> East Technical High School was one of the best schools in the country at that time. Mm-hmm. They taught me architecture there, which you couldn't you couldn't find in in, in first and second year colleges today. Is that right? Oh, it, it was. We we had a I, not only that we studied Latin. Can you mm-hmm. imagine studying Latin in East Technical High School? Yeah. We did. And it was an right? integrated school? At that right? t- it was integrated at that time? I was there. But but the point was, it was a select school. You couldn't go, you just don't go to East Tech. Oh. You had to be selected to go to East Tech. Because on the east side, there was a technical school. On the west side, it was called West Tech. Okay. So anybody on the east side of Korea wanted to study technology, aer- aerospace, engineering, architecture, went to East Tech. But you were, you had to pass, you know, make the grade. So that's when I uh, uh, studied architecture. I was uh, elected to the Corinthian Club, which was the exclusive club. Uh, you might know this, but Harrison Dillard was at, Har- at, at East Tech at that time, and we had a great track team. We won the state championship. I'm trying to remember their names now. Harrison Dillard was on that team. Was Jesse Owens there at that time? Jesse Owens before us. Jesse okay. Owens was in 19, he, he was at the, America, the Olympics in 1936. Okay. So at that time he was at Ohio State when he went to, to right run the Olympics mm-hmm. game. But uh, we, we were living in Cleveland and the ghetto in Cleveland was, we, we didn't go beyond 79th Street. No kidding. No, we, we, that was where we were. And I mean, when I say the ghetto, unlike today, mm-hmm. uh, the doctor lived here, the dentist lived here, the prostitute lived here, the pimp lived here, the funeral director lived here. So it was, a, it was every, we were all black. That's Everybody. only we had in common. Mm-hmm. We were all black. I think there was, I might have to say though, that was not a bad time because no. children had a chance to select which one of these people you want to identify with because they see them. Mm-hmm. Today, in the ghetto, you see one socioeconomic class and that's it. Right. Uh, I finished East Tech and I had honors and I would know I was supposed to win the uh, math prize uh, which they give to the best students in mathematics but they decided that uh, it was a tie with Sinkovich who was a white boy so Sinkovich and Madison tied for the uh, arts for the math prize at East Technical High School how are you gonna solve that? You're gonna solve that by having a having a, a, a test. Mm-hmm. So we came in on a Saturday. He's sitting on one side of the room. I'm on the other side of the room. We took this test. Mm-hmm. When it's all over, they decided it was still a tie. Now I know very well if he had won, <laughs> it, would, <laughs> it that, wouldn't have been a tie. Not a tie, but it's tie. So so we shared the math prize at East Technical High School because it was a tie. I don't know, a tie. But. Uh, we, we were still poor here in Cleveland. Uh, we lived at uh, a lot of places in Cleveland. 59th Street in Quincy, 46th Street. We lived across the street from St. John AME Church around that, that community. Mm-hmm. 
I remember that the, the farthest east I had ever gone was 79th Street. And the reason was because there was a model airplane store at the corner of 79th and Euclid. And we used to walk up, you know, ride. We had no cars, no telephone, no, no, no television, <laughs> none of that kind of stuff. <laughs> no, no, we, no we, we read books and we went up to, uh, made model airplanes. So we had to go up to 79th Street because there was a store on the corner of 79th and Euclid that sold the kits. Mm -hmm. And we'd come back in little balsa wood and, and cellophane paper mm -hmm. through our airplanes. Uh, I graduated in uh, 1940 from East Technical High School. Uh, and then uh, I went to college. I, I can only say, going back now, is that one thing I forgot, I told you that when, when I was born, my mother said, you've been an architect. Mm -hmm. When June was born, she said, June, you're going to be an, enge you're going to be an engineer. Right. Yes, mother. Stanley, she said, you're going to be a preacher because you got to pray for all this. <laughs> and Bernard was going to be an architect. So my mother contrived. She said, we're going to have two architects, me and, and uh, Bernard, mm -hmm. two engineers, my father and Julian, and for somebody to pray for us. No kidding. That's what, that was her, because she said he couldn't get a job. And she would say, we will fa have our own firm one day. We'll never have to ask people for work anymore. No kidding. That's how we, that's how Robert P. Madison was destined, from my mother's point of view, to get this thing going. My goodness. And we did. Uh -huh. But in, in view of that, and the other thing is that during, even during the Depression, my mother said, my boys are going to go to college. You're crazy, lady. You, you know, you're sitting out in the street during the Depression. We had to come home from school, and you all your furniture sitting out in the rain is coming down like this, and that's all your belongings. But we're evicted. But uh, I guess it made us steal. And my mother was one who was saying, you know, we're going to, we're determined. We're going to fight this thing. People thought she was crazy. Mm -hmm. But uh, we came to, to, to Cleveland, and we, she joined. She was a great Christian. Mm -hmm. She was an absolute uh, devout in church all day Sunday, all day, you know, like that. What church did you attend? St. John to? Amy Church, right okay. down here. And I still belong to St. John mm -hmm. Amy Church. Uh, that's about all I can say. Uh, in Cleveland, we lived at 79th, we lived at, at, at 59th Street, and that was shouted. Some of the churches that, that are there, but that was a ghetto. Mm -hmm. uh, after I finished East Technical High School, I wanted to go to college, where at that time, to study architecture, you could go to Howard, uh, Tuskegee, and Hampton. Those are the only schools that taught architecture for black people. Mm -hmm. Now, if you could get into Harvard, you could go there. Harvard and print those schools would, would permit black people to come. But you had to have $15,000 a year to pay the tuition. Well, back in those days, <laughs> one, one, $15 a year was, was a lot. So. It, that was that. It was out of the question. Mm -hmm. So I went to Howard University on a scholarship, uh, and I and because I, I made I was a I was National Honor Society. I was a good student. You were a good student. And got to Howard University, and uh, I was admitted to the School of Architecture. And at that time, there were only five of us, five students studying architecture back in those days. Uh, we. Uh, we didn't have much social life because architects don't have much social life anyway. I didn't have any money because uh, I went. To, I tell people and they don't believe it. I went to the college with one and a half suits. That means I had a jacket and a pants that matched, and another pair I didn't match. That's one and a half suit. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I had about five shirts, but my mother taught me how to iron, how to wash and iron, and uh, press all that. Mm -hmm. And so I took in laundry. At college, no <laughs> took it and washed it down in the laundry room of, yeah. of the cook hall. Yeah. And this is the point. My roommate was a guy by the name of we called him Pinocchio because he had a sort of a. He came from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. You see, if you come from the south, they had what they call out of state aid. Do you know about out of state aid? Mm. Do you know about it? Yes. Okay. Well, out of state aid means this. In the segregated South, oh. if you wanted to go to study architecture, 
They wouldn't let you study in those schools there, but they would pay for you to go to any place you could go up north. Oh, so it's not the same out-of-state aid that we know about. No, they, they, so, so, <laughs> so my point is that my roommate had 22 shirts because the state paid for all this, you see. He had he stipend to keep him from going to their school. Isn't that something? Well, when he showed up with 22 shirts and I had five, he had to have I said, I'll wash them. So that's how I earned some of my, my, my getting through. Yeah. And then I got a job uh, as the uh, errand boy for the dean because I was a good student. And it happened that the dean of the School of Arch Architecture and Engineering at the time was a classmate of my father at Howard. No kidding. So that was a whole uh, generation that he knew me. And uh, architects were sort of, they were different kind of people. They didn't have a lot of social life, you know, we just worked all the time into the studio we call it, designing Sunday all day long. Mm -hmm. and it happens on one, uh, one Sunday, we were in the studio there, uh, called December the 7th, 1941. Oh boy. And uh, the radio came on and we heard President Roosevelt saying that Japan has just bombed Pearl Harbor. Mm. And our life changed right there. But I would like also to say that another one of my loves is the opera. And it happens that there was only one radio owned by all the students at Howard University. One. No kidding. But this, this, see, you, you, you all spoiled. <laughs> you wouldn't believe. What? You know, we had to couldn't afford a radio, yeah. portable radio. But this one guy, Oscar Peterson, Arnold Peterson, had owned the radio. He was an older person than we were because he he had been he fought in the Spanish American Spanish War, Civil War of Spain, and came back and he studied in architecture. He liked the opera. Mm -hmm. So every Saturday he'd turn on the opera and we would say, well, he's going to turn that thing off, man. <laughs> Crazy or something. He said, look, you don't have to listen. And he played it. And he played it. I said, well, since we can't beat him, we got to join him. <laughs> and that's when I began to develop a love for the opera. It was forced upon me. Isn't it? And I, I'm happy today because of that. But that was, that was my introduction to the opera well. I'm going fast, I guess, but I get, is this what you're looking for? Yes, it is. So you weren't in school very long. When you graduated in 1940, and you had only been in Howard for not even a full year. No, I was, no, 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 a full year. Okay. See, now what happened, uh, I went to Howard in 1940. Okay. But, but Pearl Harbor was not to 41. That's the whole year. Yes. And then I was in ROTC, which is called the Reserve Officer Training Corps, and I got into advanced class then because I didn't want to go out and be enlisted. Right. So I didn't leave Howard to 43. Okay. So I was at Howard from uh, 40 to, 40 to 41, 42, 40, 42 and a half years ago. We, we left in the, in the spring of 43. Uh, and we were, see, I was in ROTC. That's Reserve Officer Training Corps. And usually you take four years, and when you come out, you're a commissioned officer, mm -hmm. second lieutenant. Well, we didn't have no four years. They were either draft us or but we were we were in there and we were in line to go to Officer Candidate School to be commissioned. So uh, we were in classes back and forth, people coming and going, the war was on and lots of people some were some were, were uh, uh, signing up, others were being drafted. So uh, it came around, I was still in school. We thought we were going to escape. We thought we'd be able to finish our college career, but we didn't. They came and got me March of 1943. Yeah, that's when they were. And went to Camp Cross, South Carolina, enlisted. It happens that we were 21 of us in ROTC, so we were sort of a special group. And uh, that was a remarkable experience for me because I was, at that time, I was... Uh, I was, I think I was 20 years old, 20 years old when I left it. Yeah, 20 years old. I went to uh, Camp Cross, which is in South Carolina, and here we met a whole lot of other troops, a lot of, lot of young men from the South, mm -hmm. well, Alabama, did all that, Camp Cross, that's mm -hmm. where the camp was. Mm -hmm. They promoted me and my group to private first class because we were a little above them. 
But very shortly I found out that most of the people there couldn't read or write. So I would spend my time writing letters home to them and reading the letters that they sent back. These, these were showing up country boys. I mean, they were southern country boys, black, of course, all black. Mm -hmm. But uh, we who were, had been at Howard, so some of these kids had never finished the eighth grade, but that was it. So anyway, from Camp Croft, we were there for what we call basic training. Mm -hmm. And we left Camp Croft to go to Greensboro, because we finished our basic training. Mm -hmm to go to Greensboro, North Carolina. There was a school there. I don't forgot the name of that. Much, 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 North Carolina A &T. State. A &T. A &T, right. Mm -hmm. And we were on what was called the Army Special ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program, mm -hmm. because we were going to be uh, officers in the Army of the United States of America at a given time. Mm -hmm. Well, we went to Greensboro, North Carolina, and uh, we were training there for about uh, two weeks, and we finally got back to Howard University. See, but the reason we got back but to But you're still in the service. Oh, we're in the service now. But the reason we got back to Howard, because they were not ready to receive us at Officer Kansas School in Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. They had never had this many black boys come on to become officers ever. So they had to wait until there was an opening, because they weren't going to mix us up. Wait till the whole barrack that was free so we could go down. In the meantime, we were back at Howard. And since we were the private first class, we had some arm experience. They had an ASTP program there, which was all of the men. They either went to, were drafted, mm -hmm. or if they stayed in school, or what was our Army Specialized Training Program. Mm -hmm. And they had to wear uniforms. They were in the military, mm -hmm. and so were we. But <laughs> we, uh, because we were ROTC cadets, we were the cadet. I was a cadet com commandante. I was a cadet commanding officer. I was a colonel. Hmm. And I, some of these people, they're all dead. Most of them are dead now, but we became doctors and lawyers, Mitty Lambright, and you know, was yeah. Kenny Clement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember and I was... Were there? Oh, yeah, I was commanding them because I was the senior of the, of the ASTP program. Mm -hmm. But what I'm laughing about is because they tried to run this like a real uh, military installation, so we had guard duty, you know, and, and you had to have people standing guard. Mm -hmm. I assigned the people who were going to stand guard, and I assigned all the doctors and all the lawyers who were going to be there, and we were going to stand guard on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> we laugh about that to this day, because, you know, they, so we said, well, you're going to be here, we're not, we're going we're to join. So we, we lived in the barracks. We lived mm -hmm. in the young dumb barracks. So we were there, and I was in ROTC, at ASTP until uh, about February of 1944, so that was about a semester. Mm -hmm. While there, incidentally, uh, I was ASTP cadet, and uh, yes, one too. I met Leatrice Mattis, Leatrice uh, Brandt. Okay. I was introduced to Leatrice Brandt by one of my friends there. <laughs> I'll never forget this. I was so much trying to impress her. I had a parade for her. I called out the entire cadet corps. Did you? Pass and review. Oh, she wasn't impressed with a <laughs> quarter. Anyway, I talked to, I said, uh, you know, I don't know, a lot of these guys, Joe Martin, we're, we're in that good area, remember all that. Joe Martin, Carlos De Leon. At any rate, uh, in uh, spring of 44, we were all sent to Fort Benning, Georgia mm -hmm. for officially going to Officer Kansas School because at that time a barrack had been cleared out. They could put okay. us in one barrack. Well, we got to OCS and it was a 17-week program called the 70-week wonders where we were trained to become officers. But uh, we were all black. We kept us in the line, all black. Same barrack. But then what's happened is that you could go into uh, uh, 70 we could go into Columbus, Georgia a weekend for recreation, whatever you wanted. But you had to find a way to get there. And there were no, they didn't have blacks or whites riding on the same vehicle. So if it was a taxi cab, you had to wait till you got all blacks in taxi cab where you couldn't go. Well, I went into, into Columbus once, because this was too much of a hassle, so waiting on the road for somebody to bring it back. But that was the way it was. We were isolated, we were segregated, but we graduated. And when I graduated from um, Officer Kansas Creek, the second lieutenant, I was immediately assigned to Fort Huachuca. 
Arizona. And Fort Huachuca was where the 92nd Division, the Buffaloes, and the 93rd were trained. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was initially sent to the Corps of Engineers because I'm an architect. Mm -hmm. But that didn't make any sense for the military. They assigned me to the infantry. <laughs> I said, I'm a sign in, I'm a foot soldier. But, uh, but what happened though, they made me battalion S2, which was the intelligence officer battalion, because I was an officer and I was black. You know this, in the Buffalo, the all above the rank of second lieutenant were white. Oh. All the troops were black. Okay. But all the, the people who were above that were, were, were white. Oh yeah, and uh, there were, so there was just a handful of black officers all the troops were uh, black, and the uh, non-commissioned officers were black, but these officers were white. Well, we were at Fort Huachuca from uh, 17 weeks, uh, and it happens that one week uh, I came down with a case of the mumps. I went to the infirmary, and they kept me there for a week. Well, what happened there was when I was kept there for a week, my class had graduated. And they spent a week trying to figure out what to do with me. And it happens that my, one, my toes overlap on my left and right foot just slightly. They were trying to find a way to get rid of me. So they said, I couldn't, you know, you got these bad toes. <laughs> What's this got to do with No. So they had me, uh, so they were, gonna, they, were trying to, they were trying to get me discharged on the base of physical infirmity. Yeah. So I had to go out and run around the track three times to prove that I could still run. Oh yeah, this is you want to hear it? I think I got enough to do just to begin it. Anyway, I proved that I could run, and they said, okay, he's going to be an officer. And I was then put in a barrack to white folks, because they didn't have any, my, my yeah. group had gone on. Yeah. But I was put in this corner, and that was where I was. And they didn't speak to me, and I didn't speak to them, sorry me, and sorry with them. I talked to myself, you know, at night walking through the woods. So that was, uh, mm -hmm. we, went on, we went on maneuvers, and on maneuvers going through, which it didn't make any difference you had a uniform, you were black. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the townspeople treated us just like that. You can't eat in this restaurant, you can't walk down the street. Although we had the uniform on, we were black. We used to go over to Nogales, Texas, Nogales, Mexico, right across the border uh, for, uh, Rest and recuperation for the weekend. Some guys found a, a means of uh, using that that it was <laughs> for other purposes, <laughs> but that was where we went. Uh, all the towns in uh, Arizona were off limits with black soldiers. You see, the reason really? for the, the re this the reason for for what you guys know, it was it was far away you could get. There was no state in the country that would accept having twenty thousand black folks armed on that territory, in that state. No state would take us. So Fort Huachuca, which is just almost across the, the Mexican border, that was as far away you can get from civilization, but that's where they put us. Because they didn't, they couldn't stand, you know, people, 20,000 black men with guns? That wasn't going to happen. So that's where, that's where he went to Fort Huachuca. And so Fort Huachuca is in Arizona. Oh, yeah. Right on the border of Mexico. Exactly. And right. they are considered the Buffalo Soldiers. We were the Buffalo. The 92nd Infantry Division were the Buffalo Soldiers, right? Isn't that something? Yeah. And so... Did you see the article in the newspaper about the Buffalo Soldiers? Recently? It was about four months ago, six months ago, when Spike Lee's movie came through here. My picture was in there. Okay. With the Buffalo Soldiers, yeah. Anyway, uh, Isn't that something? We, uh, we left Fort Huachuca on a troop train, and we didn't know where we were going. They wouldn't tell us where we were going. Mm -hmm. And I had decided, well, they're going to send us to some place and make us quartermaster corps, where, you know, you take, unload the freights and put them on the trains. That's where the, all the black soldiers had been before then. Mm -hmm. So we got on this boat, and we had to, it took us 13 days to get from Hampton Roads, Virginia, to Italy. We didn't know where we were going. We had no idea where we were going. So we landed. And just before land, they gave the officers an uh, English Italian dictionary. <laughs> so we could say, hello, how you do to the people there. We got off, we went to bivouac, and we bivouacked in what was called the old Henning King's hunting grounds, you know, a great big area with hunting grounds. 
We were there in Naples. Naples is the king's hunting ground. And we were there from about the middle of August. This is, I had my twenty yesterday, I had my twenty first birthday on board ship. July the twenty eighth, forty four, I was twenty one years old. And I tell these kids that I was leading troops in combat when I was twenty one years 21 old. Twenty one years. That's right. Can you just put a pin there? Why did they call it the Buffalo Soldiers? They called the Buffalo Soldiers for this reason. During the Indian Wars, the uh, Americans, which included black troops, 25th Infantry Division, were fighting the Indians, um, part of the America, you know, the, the, this westward movement. And it happens that the Indians saw these black people and saw their kinky hair and said they looked like buffaloes. <laughs> so we became the Buffalo Soldiers. Right. This is the buffaloes, you know, black skinned, kinky hair, and uh, we, and then so, sometimes the, the guys wore, uh, put skins on, which made them even more pronounced. And we were then the buffalo soldiers, and we have proud of that, quite proud of that, we're proud of it for all the years we carried that name. So, the buffalo soldier is an honored name that goes way back a long time. So, did you actually engage in? With the Indians, oh, that, that was done. Listen, right? now look, you got to go back and do some history. We're talking about 1850. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You talking about? Okay, but the name carried. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, okay. what you see, the thing about the, about the about the army, you get a name and you get forever if it's okay. if it's honorable. No. Now that's for the camera. Yeah, see, I, yeah, I, no, no, no. <laughs> the 18. 1800. They settled the West. Yeah, is that okay. right? Right, right, right. But you know, the kids are going to say, well, how, how Well, that's how we came, called it, and we're very proud of that heritage. Anyway, to make a long story short, we were in the King's Hunting Grounds for about two weeks. This is the latter part of August, and they say, you're going to move forward. We said, move forward to where? We're going up. And I was an officer, and I, I didn't know exactly what was happening. But anyway, soon found out, not only did they give us English-American dictionary, English-Italian dictionary, they finally gave us ammunition. We didn't have live ammunition until we were on that boat. We had no ammunition back in here. And uh, so we were headed north. And on September the 1st, I will never forget this as long as I live, September the 1st, 1944, we went into combat. And this was the first black soldiers in combat as a unit in the Second World War. Yeah. We crossed the Arno River, just north of Pisa. Uh, and it happens that I was set battalion S2, S but I got demoted. <laughs> because because uh, I was in that, when we were trying to make a reconnaissance across the river to see what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You have people, troops go over there to look around and come back and report before the whole force goes over. Okay. Well, I was, went down to the front line to get the information for the battalion commander and uh, talked to some of my guys who were heads of these companies that said, we're going to launch, we're going to move in, in, in 12, 1,200, 2,400 hours. That's midnight in the Army. So I went back up to battalion headquarters and I said, okay, troops in place, Major. When will you start the artillery bombardment? He said, ain't going to be one. I said, what do you mean ain't going to be one? But we're not going to have an artillery. You know, usually bombard the place over, then the troops move in. We're not going to have that. I said, what do you mean you're not going to have that? He said, well, Mark Clark has said, he's the commanding general of the Army, is that uh, we, can't, uh, we can't do it because we have to send signals up to stop the bombardment. This 21-year-old kid says, get me Mark Clark on the telephone. <laughs> they thought I was free. He's loony. He's the commanding general of the of the of the Fifth Army, not just Ninety Second Division. Get, so, so, so the next day they said this guy he's he's got a screw loose. I was demoted. But I got to tell you this so uh, before. So they demoted you for, for So 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 the next day, uh, I was no longer battalion S two intelligence officer. I was a first lieutenant, second leading the first platoon in battle to go across the river. See, as S2, you're up there at the battalion headquarters, up to, but now they demoted me to become a, and they also made way for an incompetent white officer, 
come back. So, uh, how much more time we got? This is just the beginning. I thought it would take a little while. Okay. What time is? How much? And we just forgot. I ought to write a book. Anyway, we advanced. Uh, troops went up. There was a famous Chinquale fiasco in which uh, the, the 365th Infantry was almost wiped out because they were sent in to an area to capture it. They had not prepared the ground. These white officers, these white encompasses, they had the strategy was bad. The troops went in there and they were trapped. Anyway, uh, I, I was in a different, I was in, I was in a 370, they had, they had regiments. 365th, 366th, 370th, and 371st. I was 370. We were the first ones in combat. The other regiments came later. But uh, so the 370th, we call it, we were the mighty 370th, the 92nd Division. Mm -hmm. You know, like a unit, mm -hmm. like this. And we went into battle, and uh, I was, uh, I can tell you about the times I escaped death like you wouldn't believe this quick. Once uh, when I'd been demoted now, I, uh, had these troops. I had, I had 40 men under my command as a platoon leader. Mm -hmm. There were three squads of 15 soldiers each. And uh, <laughs> when we moved through, through the country, see, see, this war was not like what you see now. We didn't fight in the cities hand to hand. We fought into the countryside. And the troops, German troops would move here we boom up this way and we shoot them. And it wasn't, you know, it, Rome is like it, it is today, and apparently, because they didn't bomb those cities. It was civilized. You know, back then, it had been torn up. Mm -hmm. But this was a civilized one. We just strategy and stuff like that. Anyway, one day, which I w will not forget, is I was, had my troops with me, night was falling, and I saw this farmhouse over there with this great big villa. I said to my soldier, we're going we're gonna to bivouac biv down here tonight. We're going to spend the night down here. So I went up to the front door to ask the uh, owner if he just let my troops be out here. Was no problem. So a butler came to the door. And I said, I, w I was speaking Italian and very fluently. He says, uh, I have my troops here. We want to spend the night here on your campgrounds. He said, well, here I get the Padroni. That was the owner of the house. And I looked up, and here was this great gigantic stairway that you see in movies, you know, this great elegant, and here's this white, this guy, coming down the Italian guy with flowing silver, uh, silk robes on, golden white hair, beautiful. And I explained to him what I want. He says, do you know who I am? I said, no, I don't know you. He said, I'm Admiral, I'm Giuseppe Garibaldi, Admiral of the Italian Navy. I said, really? And I'm Robert P. Madison, second lieutenant, United States Army. And I got the guns. <laughs> but anyway, he said, oh, you sleep. So we slept there that night. Anyway, so I got thousands of those kind of things. But uh, I'll never get that. That was kind of fun. He said, you can sleep now. Uh, another time, we, we, were, we were moving forward, always moving forward. and. Uh, Moved into this small village, come in near this uh, farmhouse. So we sleep that night in the farmhouse. And uh, we went to bed, and I thought something was eerie about all this. I called my troops together, we down on our knees and prayed. After we got up and get ready to go to sleep, all of a sudden we heard this enormous sound, Whoa! screaming sound came. And I said, and sure enough, we tipped up the stairway, and there was a shell about from here to that wall, this high. But it, it came in and hit like this. If it hit like that, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be here. We saw it on, the, on just spinning around because it came, you, see what I'm, you know, if you, see, the plunger is here. If you hit it on, it goes right in like that. Mm -hmm. But if you hit it at an angle, it doesn't plunge. That saved my life. Wow. I can tell you another one. I can tell you, I can go on and on and on, but I won't. <laughs> one more. Well, I can tell you about uh, the day that I got wounded. Okay. So it happens that uh, 
during that period, we, I'd go into Florence. And this, getting back to the opera, when you, in Italy, that's where he's, he, you know, and I heard, I had this introduction at, at the architecture school in Italy, the kids come down the street, La Donne and Mobile, everybody's singing. So we would go to the opera houses when we had restaurant recuperation in Florence. I, and I would go, and the other guys went to other kind of houses. <laughs> but I went to the opera houses, see. And uh, that's when I really became an opera nut. And I could, I was, my ear, because Italian should throw it. Potatoes at him if he's not good, and I'd learn how to be discerning. At any rate, uh, we were. That was that's my that's how I learned the opera it's because I really you know I could, I'd go down the street I'd sing it like the others because that was a theater they went to. They didn't go to see cowboys. They went to see the opera. Anyway, this famous so on 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 Christmas Day, December the twenty sixth, December the twenty fifth, nineteen forty four. Countess Laura Ferrari gave a party for the American troops. Big bill. I was the guy who had the, I was now motor officers, and I had all the uh, vehicles, so we got to have some girls, so I got this six-ton truck. <laughs> Went around through the villages, round up all these ladies, and came to the party, and we had a nice time. We had a wonderful time. Just one of them. I mean, they, they, were, they were happy to see American troops. And I, I can tell a whole story about black troops. They, they, you know, they, they, the white soldier says they got tails, they're not the animals. <laughs> well, you know, some of the people want to see them tails. Some of the girls want to see those tails, <laughs> which you can, t you can go from there. <laughs> and you proved there was no tail. No tail. <laughs> but uh, this, so we had this wonderful party. It was a very, and they would celebrate. We had Indian officers, Senegalese officers, American officers, white officers. But over there, you just had this party. So that was okay, December the 26th. Uh, and the Germans knew we were partying, and they were laying ready for us. So it happens that uh, I had to go to battalion headquarters. And generally, there's this vehicle like this. The driver sits here, and I sit right here an officer, mm -hmm. my driver. I said, then, you know, you don't have to go today because you had a good time last night in June. So you stay. I, I'll, I'll go up there. You don't have to drive. Okay. So I'm driving up this road, and it was a single road, mountains here, valley down there. I'm sitting here. And the shell came in here, tore up the dress, tore up the jeep, and threw me about 50 feet away. And I had shrapnel in my liver and my ankle. If I had been sitting there, that's mm -hmm. my point. Mm -hmm. If I was there, well, I was supposed to be sitting, I wouldn't be today. Another time, I wouldn't be today. Anyway, so I was shipped, went to uh, some couple of white boys saw me, uh, grabbed me out there, and it was, went back to uh, what was called Battalion Aid Station. Mm -hmm. That's the first place where they bandage you up. And I was feeling kind of sorry for myself because my left leg, ankle had shrapnel in it, and it had, it had shrapnel in my abdomen here. And I said, I was feeling a little bit sorry for myself until I got to the battalion aid station. And when I got to battalion aid station, I saw men didn't have arms. Mm -hmm. Men didn't have feet. So, you know, no matter how bad you think you are, mm -hmm. that's when I realized I was a lucky guy. Because I thought it was not Anyway, I was in the hospital, battalion aid station. And when they shipped me, that was just to tie up. Then you had, they had field hospitals where uh, we went, they flew us back to Chivitavecchia, where there was a field hospital. Everybody was down. They operated for me that day. But before that, the Germans were bombing, not the, but around that hospital. I thought we were going to, we were going us to here. So we made it through that. And then uh, I got, I was recuperating. They took the shrapnel out and sewed me up, and I was recuperating all right. It happens that I had a tonsillectomy. And the guy, these were all, you know, young doctors who came out of college and they were trying to become serious. They, he's going to cut my tonsils out. So he did, but he cut the vein. And he was trying to sew it up, and the needle broke off. So he said, well, he'll be all right. 
So I went back, and a week later I fainted because I was ble bleeding, just continuously bleeding. And they found out I had lost a quarter of my blood. So then they got all nervous about this, and they, I did not. That meant the point of this all is I stayed another month in the hospital trying to get rid of that thing. When I came out, the war was over. April, April 1945, that's when, at least there they declared it was over. And so I was about ready to rejoin my outfit. Uh, and, uh, but I had to stay another, another year because uh, we didn't have enough points to come home. The points, if you, because I was an officer, if you wound, you get X number of points. You get X. anyway. I was there for another year when I really got to the opera. I really had a ball in buying but and reading out an architecture. So uh, I uh, finished my tour over there for another year, and I came back in 1946. It was discharged at a camp whose name I don't remember now. I came back to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Some folks were here in Cleveland. And that's when I went up to reserve to try to get enrolled, and they said, we don't hire, we don't let colored people go to school. Well, see, I had the GI Bill of Rights. I could afford it now. I could afford to pay for it. So they said, no, we don't do that. I said, wait a minute. So I went back home, put on my uniform, came back up there and said, wait a minute. My blood is over there. I'm sore. They're fighting to make this country. You tell me I came to this school? So they went around for about a couple of hours discussing the finance. Oh yeah, you can join, but you got to take examinations at summer. So every Saturday, I was up at Western Reserve University taking an examination. Anything they threw at me—English, physics, whatever. Well, I must have passed because the day before admission, they let me in. Called me, Mr. Mack, you can come to school now. I said, fine. So I was admitted to the reserve, but they won't get rid of me. <laughs> yeah, I think I got a wild. Thing. They put me in the. In the, in the classes that had the toughest, physics and French. And you had a whole, you had a whole room here, about 300 students, and the professor would go to the blackboard and just start at 8 o'clock and finish at 8.30, he, nobody looked up. I went home that night, one night, but two weeks later, and said, I'm going to study my homework this night. I went back, I got studied, I was ready. So sure enough, he's up, he said, Mr. Madison, you come to the blackboard. Never been done before. Never been done before. Well, I was ready for it. <laughs> I was ready for it. I'd done my homework. <laughs> he looked at me. He didn't call me thereafter anymore. Wow. Then, uh, <coughs> then, then uh, the dean, he was he taught history of art. He's the one that didn't want me there in the first place. And I had to get out in a certain amount of time because I spent two years in the war. I, my education, my life was leaving me. So he taught history of architecture, and I went to him and I said, you know, Dean, I'm so anxious to get in your class. I just can't wait. Uh, I'm sure I'll have a wonderful experience, Dean. I said, incidentally, I want to ask you, Dean, uh, was it Giuseppe Bramante that designed the Gates of Paradise, or was it Brunelleschi? He looked at me and said, you pass. <laughs> He didn't want to be embarrassed if I had to take that course. I so I passed that. Mm -hmm. Then there were structures that I was out of sequence. And this I went there in uh, in in it was about February. And I told the professor the course started in September. This was uh, about uh, about March. I said I'd like to sit in on your course. But to make a long story, he said, Well, why not? What you got to lose? You know, just sit there. So I would go home at night, and I would study till three or four, four o'clock in the morning, trying to catch up from March, from, from September. They started in September. This is now March, and I would come to this class every morning and sleep because <laughs> I haven't studied all night. Mm -hmm. But time for the final examination, I said, "You mind if I take the examination, Dean?" He said, "Well, well look, take the examination. You know, you're going to start studying." As if I passed it with a B. He said, these kids have been there since, since uh, September, got C's and D's. we got to move this guy through. So they let me go on through there. Check that out. <laughs> wow. So I got through, I got through West Reserve University. Uh, then there was one other incident which accelerated this whole program. The senior class before me, class of 47, they had a party. 
graduating party. And when the gradu everybody comes to the graduating club. And the party was held at the Bratton Hall Country Club. So I was the only black in the class. I do you know that. You can determine that. So I said, guys, come on, go. Come back. Why don't you come and go with me? I said, okay, I'll come to the party. So I came to the party. And this is a country club. The, the white folks do it. They have uh, swimming. And this, they play the golf and tennis. And after that, they come to eat at 6 o'clock. Well, I was, all in, I was living the project at the time. I couldn't do it that time. So I got there at 6 o'clock just to eat the dinner. At 6 o'clock, nobody was eating. Uh -huh. I know what they're not eating. Nobody else knows. So pretty soon the dean comes out and says, uh, they would like to see you in the manager's office. I know what's coming. Okay. So I went to the manager's office. Here was the manager of the country club. I said, oh, Mr. Madison, uh, you know, it's, we got a real problem here. Uh, you know, uh, the code, the, the charter of the of the club said we don't serve color people. And I looked at him and I said, I ain't got no problem. You got a problem. <laughs> I'm here. I paid my dues. I belong to the class, and I'm here. And he was tearing his hair. What would the members say? I just looked at him. And the dean, and I paid my dues, see. I paid my money. So the dean was sitting there, the guy who didn't want me to put, he was tearing his hair out. <laughs> And they got 400 meals sitting in the refrigerator waiting to be eaten. <laughs> so, Phil Hart, one of my classmates said, well, look, you know what? He's Jewish fellow. He said, if Bob doesn't eat, I'm not going to eat. And when he said that, they saw all these 400 meals being sitting up there, not eating. Because they're going to leave. They're just going to leave. So, he said, well, okay, well, Mr. Madison, uh, yeah, we'll make this little exception for you. So, uh, I ate. That's when they decided to get rid of me. So they got rid of me. I didn't take this course. I didn't take that course. As a matter of fact, I was graduating. And I didn't know this till later. And I had never passed the courses you're supposed to pass to get out of Western Missouri University. But they gave me this degree to get rid of me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they got rid of me. Graduated from Kansas It was just Western Missouri University. Yeah. Right? So they got this degree from Western Missouri University. Anyway. So, uh, gee whiz, this is getting too long, isn't it? Can we come back another time? Because I do have to meet with somebody, but okay. I'll just go a little longer. <coughs> Excuse me. It's fine. I think about it. They have what was called a, uh, architecture students have prizes, you know, competitions. And uh, I was the head of a team of three other students. Mm -hmm. I was the chief architect, there was one the landscape architect, there was a painter and a sculptor. And we had to design this building. And I was the primary designer, and we submitted it to Rome, called the Rome Prize. And my team won honorable mention. So now they got a big problem. I'm the only one in the school that won honorable mention. This is a worldwide competition. <laughs> I, won, I won honorable mention. So we're going to do this guy now. <laughs> you can't plug him. <laughs> so the next year they said, you graduate, sir. Thank you very much. And I didn't realize it. I didn't realize until I went to start to go to Harvard that I didn't have all the qualifications for research. But what happens was that, uh, like I said, so then uh, I, up there on the picture, there's a picture. I, I had to get a, I graduated. And they, I graduated with honors. They gave me the Janssen book because my thesis was better than anybody else's. I went down. I said, I got to get the job somehow. So uh, I went to the offices in Cleveland. Architecture firms. Said, we don't hire color people. I said, I just want to fill out the app. We don't hire color people. So I went to about four offices. We don't hire color people. So I said, okay. There's a guy by the name of Robert A. Little who was one of my professors here in the office. I went to see him and I said, look, before you say anything, I will work for you for nothing for two weeks. Then you can decide whether you can hire me or not. He said, I'll think about it. Right there, 1303 Prospect Avenue. So he said, I'll let you know. I went, and I was living in the project at that time. 2560 B's 43rd Street. <laughs> Didn't have a car, I walked, took the bus. 
Anyway, uh, about two weeks later, he called me. He said, come on, you can go to work for me. 1303 Platt, when I went in the building, everybody knew my name. He had to get permission from everybody in that building to hire this black kid. Mm -hmm. But then he decided to pay me. He said, well, he said, you know, I, I can't, I, this is now uh, uh, April, and uh, I can let you work for a, a month because uh, the guy I had who went to Harvard is coming back and worked this summer. I said, okay. So when the month came up, I said, and I was good, you know, I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I said, well, it's time for me to go. He said, oh, no, 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 let's, 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 let's think about it. Well, no, no, no. I said, no, you told me I had to, you were going, oh, no, 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 no. I was I was letting upside down so you could read so, so I stayed there three more years. So. Yes. Yeah. Then uh, then I, I wanted to go to Harvard and uh, uh, he put in a he called he he was a graduate of Harvard. But uh, so he called up and uh, then it's when I found out you can't they can't go to Harvard because you haven't got a degree, you don't have all the courses that you're supposed to have from Western Reserve University. So you technically you don't have a degree. So, but I had be, I was registered an artist because I I went I studied. See these kids don't know this. I came home when I was working, and every night after dinner, I was married. Then, I got the book up and studied everything I had not learned at Western Reserve University. And when I went down to take the examination, I passed it the first time up. And even Robert Little, the guy who was working for, said he didn't pass the first time. He went and got cigars. And some brandy for us to celebrate. <laughs> Why would tell a thousand? Of First time. Oh yeah, and uh, I was then a registered doctor. So that's and so that when 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 I when I applied for Harvard, I didn't have the the, the academic requirement, but I was a registered doctor. So they admitted me. So they did. Oh yeah, I admitted to Harvard because of that. <laughs> said, wow, but not only that, when I was at Harvard, great time. They, see, but there only there were only eight. There were only eight students in each semester. This was Walter Gropius. This was, this was like, oh, this is it. There were students from Hong Kong, China. Uh, Jacek von Hindenburg was from Poland. We had a couple of white boys from the south here. One guy, Ching Ching Chen from China, and me. That was the class. So uh, <laughs> I was the only black, of course, in the whole damn place. But anyway, got along fine. And then they elected me president of the class. So I was president of the class at Harvard. Graduated. Before graduation, all the architectural firms in the country came to, to Harvard to interview the students. Nobody interviewed me. Not one interview. So this is your post? Yes, post Harvard, yeah. 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 No, they interviewed me. They don't hire blacks. <laughs> so, so then it happens that uh, the dean at Howard University asked me to come back there and work on his faculty, which is what I did. Work on his faculty? At Howard. You know, at Howard. Mm -hmm. I, I could teach. Mm -hmm. Got a master's degree. Did nobody else have a master's degree at that time? No. And nobody from Harvard with a master's degree. So I went back and I taught at Howard University for um, from 19, no, it's something else. This is wild. This is crazy. My wife uh, was working in the library because they needed somebody to help her in the library. While she was working in the library, she ran across this application for a Fulbright scholarship. So she said, why don't you apply? So I applied for a Fulbright scholarship, and I got it to study in Paris. <laughs> so, so I said, wow, we got this scholarship. It happens also, though, that that, uh, that summer, my first child was born, July 17th. And the ship sailed September the 1st to go to Paris. And we sent in a two-month-old baby. We're trying to figure out what we're going to do. And uh, some people go on. And my wife and I talked and said, we're going. So we got on the ship to go to Paris to study with a case of carnation milk. <laughs> only <laughs> black folks on there. Were, only black were on the ship. And all, only people on there with a case of carnation milk. Because they had to feed the baby. Anyway, I got to Paris, and uh, I studied, I picked up the language like that, and I was going around, first of all, going to the opera in Europe, and I was studying at, uh, at the Ecole Bazaar, it's called, but 
when I got there, they said, well, look, you know more than most of these students. Why don't you become on the faculty? I said, well, you know, I don't want to, because my French is not good enough. But so I did independent research at, uh, at, at, in Paris. And then from there, I went down to, up to Scandinavia and down to Italy to study pre-stressed concrete. That was a specialized thing that time. So, um, came back to America, went back to teach at Howard, taught the one semester and said, well, what good is it to teach these kids architecture if they can't a job? Somebody's got to start hiring them. Got to be me. Your mother. Your mother. So that's why I packed up from Howard, came right back to Cleveland and opened my office on the corner of Churchill and 105th Street, 1335 East 105th Street. We had an old house there on the corner. We gutted the house and made an architectural office of the house there. Still standing there. And the rest is history. 